Sophie, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a, it's a great pleasure to to be here and to, to look out what happened to look at what happens to demography when you know it's just a Princeton ID. That's okay. um, it's a, it's a, I, I, it's, I'm very glad to be welcomed um, to speak within a series which chiefly has to do with Europe because what I have to say today um, has to do with what we think the European Union is which might be a bit more meta than what we usually talk about when we talk about the European Union, because the European Union has the distinct feature of you know, existence without essence. Um, but, you know, but can that really be true? I mean, perhaps the European Union really is about something. What the case that I'm going to make today um, is that the European Union is about the Second World War, but not at all in the way that people present the European Union as being about the Second World War, say. So as somebody who's educated in the European Union and has spent a lot of time in the European Union, I'm very familiar with the way the European Union talks about itself, which is that the European Union is a result of the Second World War in the sense that Europeans saw that war was bad and that trade was good. And usually that spiel takes a little bit longer to work itself out, <laughs> um, but that's the essence of it. And I think it's quite essential for us to, if we're gonna understand the moment that we're in, the war in Ukraine in particular, but also the future of Europe in general, to understand that that story is completely wrong. It has no historical basis at all. So uh, the Second World War is on my mind because I was asked to speak about the European Union. Um, it's, also, it's also on my mind because of the war that is in front of our eyes. And I just want to say a moment about that war because it, it, it'll help us, I think, to, to, to take the Second World War seriously as opposed to thinking of it as just the beginning of a myth of origin. The problem with myths of origin is that the things that are at the origin of myths of origin in a weird way get elided and forgotten and stereotyped and, and, and start to become something they never really were. So the moment that we're in, I think, recalls the Second World War um, in, in a, number, a number of ways. It recalls it in its location. So if you're a historian of the Second World War, you're aware that the Second World War was fought and, and won and lost not in France or in the Netherlands or in Britain, um, but in the European theater, it was fought and lost in Ukraine and Belarus. So the terrain of battle is, is roughly similar to a terrain of battle, which is familiar to historians of, of the battlefields of the Second World War. The rhetoric, of course, of this war recalls, and I'll say a lot more about this, but the rhetoric of this war recalls the Second World War as well, um, not just in the sense that people on both sides refer to the Second World War, but also people recycle consciously, very often consciously, I think more consciously than those in America sometimes recognize, recycle both, not generally Nazi to some extent Soviet, but 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 generally, but gen, but the more often Nazi ways of looking at, at warfare. And the third is actually the scale. Um, it's not just that there hasn't been a war in Europe on this scale since the Second World War. This is just a very big war in general. The Russians have already taken half as many casualties as the Americans took in the entire Second World War, including the Pacific Theater. Right, so it's a fairly it's a fairly significant number, no matter how you want to look at it. And then, if we if we change the lens a bit, this war also recalls the Second World War in the sense of the scale of civilian suffering, um, the scale of civilian killings in Ukraine, which of course is much greater than in general people are are willing to recognize. The scale of deportations and and kidnappings in Ukraine is far greater than anything that the Ukrainians that that, that the, the Germans actually carried out. Probably everyone knows that the Germans kidnapped Polish children to Aryanize them during the Second World War. The Russians have a similar program, but on a far greater scale, actually now orders of magnitude, greater scale. Tens of thousands of Ukrainian children, according to Russian sources, have been deported and kidnapped for the purpose of, of Russification. The deportation in general is on a scale which would have been huge even by Second World War standards. More than half of the citizens of Ukraine have been forced to move in one way or another. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Russians claim to have deported most of the population of the lands that they occupy. Whether that's true or not is unclear, but they, they claim to have deported on, this, on the order of four to five million people, which is well over 10% of the population of the entire country. Um, the, um, the things which have become normal in this war, like torture, for example, um, also recall the Second World War. And also the destruction of entire cities. Um, during the Second World War, cities were destroyed in various, by various means. But if you count, apparently if you count the coffins, if you count the actual bur the burials in Mariupol, which as everybody knows is a city in, south, in southern Ukraine, which is now occupied by Russia, the scale of death there is roughly the same as Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. So we're looking at a pretty, a pretty big scale of, of, civilian, of civilian suffering. In addition to that, we do have a kind of ideological contest going on. 
it may not have the kind of openness and clarity that fascism and Stalinism and Churchill and Roosevelt had during the Second World War, but this is very clearly a war against a democracy and against the principle of democracy, a flawed democracy to be sure, um, but against the principle of democracy, something which is clearest perhaps at the local level, where in, when, when Russia occupies towns and villages, the perplexity of Russian soldiers when they encounter local elected leaders is perhaps the biggest tip-off of the, the, the clash of political civilizations which is going on here. Because Russian soldiers simply cannot imagine what for Ukrainians is a banal fact, which is that they've elected their own local leaders. Right? From, the, from the point of view of Russian soldiers, everything is a vertical of power. And so the local village leader must report to somebody, and that person reports to somebody, and that person is appointed by Zelensky, and Zelensky takes his orders from you know, Biden or whatever. But it's all a vertical of power, to use the Russian phrase. Whereas from the Ukrainian point of view, power is much more horizontal. And that's not just an attitude, it's also a fact of life. They do elect their local leaders. And it's that notion that that kind of thing is possible, which really is, which really is in fact at stake. Um, there, there's also um, interesting echoes of the Second World War in Russian legal theory about Ukraine. So this might seem like an obscure and unnecessary subject, but I think it's actually quite important. The German legal theory about Poland was that it had never existed, that it wasn't a state, and therefore what was happening is not an occupation. The Russian legal theory about Ukraine is strikingly similar, that this is not ever a state. Putin gives various rationales for this. It was never a state because somebody got baptized, baptized a thousand years ago. It was never a state because of the communists. It was never a state because of the Nazis. Um, but the, the, the theory that it's not really a state and that therefore this is not really an occupation, right? Or alternatively, that Ukrainians are not, do not constitute a nation and therefore what is happening is not aggression. Those things are, are very redolent of, of German ideas um, applied in Eastern Europe during the Second World War. Strikingly similar also um, is, is, uh, is the theory of the special military operation. So the, the theory of the special military operation was that because Ukraine doesn't really exist as a nation, the people who pretend to be Ukrainians are a thin elite at the service, right? And that the physical elimination of those people will then lead to the collapse of the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian nation. That was Hitler's theory in Operation Barbarossa, that the Soviet Union was not really a state, there was just a thin layer of essentially alien elites who would either flee or be crushed. And that, by the way, is not just a resemblance which I have noticed. It's a resemblance, it's a point which has been made by Russians and Ukrainian observers as, as, as well. And that theory, by the way, is connected, to, is connected to a conspiratorial view of the world. Because if you think that a state only exists because of imposed external elites, right, and that is explicitly Putin's view of Ukraine, that it's because of the Jews or the Germans or, or Brussels or America or whatever, that there are these fake Ukrainians at the top of the state. If that's your view, you are implicitly and eventually explicitly making a conspiratorial argument of how, how the world actually works. Right? This country with its exotic elites only exists because of the way the world is organized and the way that it's organized is conspiratorial. So if we think of the scale of this war, if we think of civilian suffering, if we think of rhetoric, um, legal theory, we have all these reasons to be thinking about the Second World War. Um, one final one, which those of you who um, are strong enough um, to watch Russian television will be aware of is, um, is the, the, the ubiquity of genocidal propaganda, which is something that's not unfamiliar to people who study, for example, um, Rwanda. But the use of contemporary mass media to, to consistently day after day transmit genocidal images, referring to Ukrainians as the latest, the latest fashion is that, they're, is that they're Satanists or devils, but also there's vermin. Um, there is, uh, there is germs, pigs, ghouls, vampire, but it doesn't really, or that they just don't exist. But the, the, the common denominator of all of these is that these are not really human beings, right? And, uh, and the implication is that therefore they don't exist or, or shouldn't exist. Another way the Second World War is recalled is by our own reaction to the Second World War, legally speaking. Uh, the most contemporary version of that would be one way to think of it, there are lots of others, you know, there are lots of lawyers in the room, but one way to think of it would be the, the, the four crimes that the, that the ICC specifies. You know, crime of aggression, crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, right? These are all things which have been formulated or reformulated after the Second World War, and they are all now being applied in various ways to Russia's war in Ukraine, and I think with, with great justification.
So in all these ways, the Second World War is present. Um, how does that matter for the European Union? Okay, like here comes the hard segue, right? How does, that, how does the fact that we're thinking about the Second World War, how on earth does that matter to the European Union? Isn't the European Union all about the present and all about processes and all about modest views of how the future might be slightly better than, than the present? Um, I, the claim that I'm gonna to try to make is that this has, the Second World War has direct bearing on what the European Union actually is, might be, um, and whether it will continue to exist in, in the future. And that, and that one way to think about the, the war in Ukraine is as an occasion to take seriously the Second World War, um, not to rethink it, but just to restate the things that we already know about it, and then contemplate what the, what the European Union looks like after that exercise. So this is the point where I need to return to the, the, founding, the founding myth of the European Union, which I've, which I've, already, which I've already rehearsed. Um, the, the, the founding myth of the European Union, namely being that uh, there was a war, we saw it, we realized it was wrong, et cetera, right? War bad. And then in, in, this, in this view, the Americans become the, con the constitutive other, right? The Americans are the constitutive other because unlike the Europeans, the Americans weren't bright enough to realize that war is bad and they keep fighting wars, right? So in this, in this version, the Americans become the constitutive other. But um, what if this isn't true, right? What if, what if this isn't true? One way to get at what I'm trying to say is to think about what the Second World War is in the standard European narration. And again, I realize that many of you have had European educations and you will raise your hand and say that like, oh, I went to the school in Liechtenstein where actually my professor said something different. But the general view is that the Second World War is called a world war because it was a big war in Europe. Second World War was a big war in Europe and that's why we call it a world war, right? Because it was a big war, therefore world war. But it was really in Europe. And the political and ethical conclusions we're going to draw from it have to do with Europe, right? They're drawn by Europeans. They have to do with Europe, right? But I mean, what if, what if that's not right? What if the Second World War was a world war for other reasons? What if the main reason the Second World War was a world war is that it was a test of certain kinds of imperial structures, some of which survived, some of which, some of which failed during the Second World War. Um, obviously, you understand that my view is the Second World War was a world war because it was a test of various kinds of newer or older imperial structures, some of which succeeded, some of which failed. Okay, so this is, um, this by the way is something that the Europeans have in common with the Russians, and it leads to, it often leads to a kind of common misunderstanding. From the Russian point of view, the Second World War, of course it's not actually called the Second World War, it's usually called the Great Fatherland War, but the Second World War was a world war because it was a big war that happened in Russia. It's not a world war because of, you know, because of, the, because of Southeast Asia or Japan or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a world war because it was a big war that happened in Russia. And Russia fought it and Russia won it and that's, and, and that's the view. Um, and it's important, it's important to see this as a kind of commonality. You know, you'll, see why, you'll see why I hope in a minute. Okay. So from this view of what the Second World War was, that it was a big, it was a big war that happened in Europe, come the standard conclusions, which are war is wrong, um, peace is definitely better, and the way you get to peace is by way of economics. Okay, those are, those are the axioms. Now, this, now I'm not gonna do, I'm, I'm, you know, I was, I, was not, I, was, I, was, uh, I was amused that Sophie introduced me uh, last as a historian. I mean, I, I was sort of waiting for like, well, like the thing he is most importantly is a parent. And like what he's, doing, what he's not doing right now is soccer practice, which is like the closest <laughs> thing to the truth. Um, or, you know, he's married to a professor and she's giving his lecture right now, which would be 100% true. Um, uh, the, uh, the, but, 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 um, but, but what I'm going to do now is, a, is the, fi the five minutes of pure history. And the five minutes of pure history are what we need, maybe only be three, but what we need to see that just as an empirical matter, the story of how Europeans learned that war was bad is incorrect, simply incorrect. And you can do this at a personal level. You can talk about Schumann. You know, you can point out that, like, at the same time, these people had these ideas about, about and, and, and these and they found these institutions that are also fighting wars, which they're going to lose off in Southeast Asia at the same time, right? Same foreign minister, same person, same time, just different places. And it's the European place which will be remembered in the European story. It's the Southeast Asian place which will get completely elided, right? You can you can do it with you can do it with De Gaulle, right? I mean, the, 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 the France, the choice for Europe, the choice for Europe. The choice for Europe is a choice against empire, right? And it's the choice which never has to explain itself, because once you've chosen against empire, the bonus points are that you never have to talk about empire again, right? It, go, it goes away. So the choice for Europe is a choice not to talk about empire afterwards. The choice for Europe is 
is a moralizing choice because it says we don't fight wars anymore and we're going to forget the wars that we fought. Okay, so that's sorry, that's the historical point. After 1945, Europeans did not cease to fight wars. That is simply not true. France fought like hell. The Netherlands fought like hell. They, they tried their best to keep their colonies. Portugal and Spain did not give up in, in Africa. Um, they lost, right? They lost. And this is the crucial thing. Empire proves to be unsustainable on the battlefield, chiefly on the battlefield. And the, and the reason that Europeans stop, stop fighting wars is not because they learned a lesson in 1945, which they did not. They stop fighting wars because they can no longer afford to do so, because they lose. Right? That's what actually happens. And the moment when they lose, the European integration project is available for them as an alternative political vision, as an alternative big economic zone, which is hugely important, right? as the first form of modern big economic zone, which is not imperial. And it's also available to them as a story. Because the story, we learned the war was bad, and therefore we traded with our former enemies, is just so much better than the story of we tortured a lot of people in Algeria and we lost anyway, right? It's so much better than the story of we couldn't, man we couldn't manage to exploit the Congo any longer, right? It's so much better than that story, than those stories, and therefore it's become the dominant story. It just has the virtue of being entirely untrue. Um, so the, uh, so this is, I mean, I won't run, through, run you through all the cases, but this is true of most cases. Um, it's the dominant story inside, inside the European Union. So, um, so where do we, where do we then go from this? What does this, what does this mean? What does this, what does this then imply? Um, it has some, some, some pretty big implications for how we think about the Second World War. So let's, let's now go back to that. The country that I haven't mentioned, you know, I talk about France and the Netherlands and so on, the country I haven't mentioned is West Germany. And the, the West German story, I think, should be understood as an extreme version of the general European story. That is to say, um, we are going to really focus on European integration, and we are really going to forget about the colonial war that we fought. And they have been successful to such an extent that almost nobody thinks of the Second World War as a colonial war. But what I'm going to claim is that there's a strong presumption for doing so. If you follow me so far, like if you're willing to accept that, that, uh, that France fought colonial wars and lost them, that the Netherlands fought colonial wars and lost them, um, if you're willing to follow me that far, you might also follow me to Italy fought colonial wars in Ethiopia and the Balkans and eventually lost. And maybe you will then follow me to the essential point, which is that Germany between 1939 and 1945 fought a colonial war and lost it. I'm going to say that the, that is, even before I get into the empirics, which I'm about to, that is the presumption we should start with, because that is what European countries generally do. That is the history of Europe in the 20th century. You, you eventually lose your last, imper your last imperial war, and then you find yourself at home in the European project, if you can. So the presumption would be, even if we didn't know anything about the empirics, the facts, the presumption would be this was a colonial war. And it was. Um, I mean, this is the way that Holocaust studies has, this is, which is where I come from, this is the way the Holocaust studies has generally moved. It's in, you know, there are arguments, of course, about, about, the, about, the, about, about the, the, the actual causal errors, but it is impossible to imagine the Holocaust of the European Jews happening without the colonial territorial aspiration to control the Western Soviet Union, chiefly Ukraine. Without that colonial aspiration, Hitler doesn't control the territories where the vast majority of European Jews live. We can argue about the causality within that framework, but as a necessary condition for the Holocaust, the colonial aspiration and the colonial control of the territory is pretty much a pure necessary condition, to use a phrase that historians are hesitant to use, but that's not only where half the Holocaust takes place, it's where the Holocaust begins, and it's where, and if you count Poland, which you have to, because Hitler has to go through Poland to get to the Soviet Union, it's where the vast majority of the Jews actually live. So Holocaust studies has pushed us in the last 20 years or so towards a recognition that this war has to be a colonial war. But once you have that recognition by way of the Holocaust, the, the basic empirical evidence is not hard to come by. If you, look at the, if you look at German war planning, or if you look at the way Hitler talks about the war, um, it's quite obvious that there are, the war is being fought not for the reasons that we in the West like to focus on, right? I mean, France is a country which has to be gotten out of the way. Um, Hitler doesn't think the British are ever going to stay in the war. He believes it's a mistake. He's confused by the fact that they stay in it. Um, the, uh, the, the Poland is meant to be an ally 
right? The, the initial idea is that Germany is going to invade the Soviet Union with Poland as an ally. And when Poland refuses in January of 39, that forces the Germans to change their plans, and they end up aligning temporarily with the Soviet Union to destroy Poland. But Poland is just in the way. The target the whole time, and this is clear at basically every level of analysis from Mein Kampf through the war plans, is Ukraine and the Western Soviet Union. And the, the, the nature of the target is colonial. We are going to transform Germany by colonizing Ukraine, um, and also secondarily by controlling the oil fields of Azerbaijan. That's also very important. So it is empirically speaking a colonial war. I think that's a, that's a view which is very hard to dispute. Um, it just doesn't fit very well with what the, with, with the West Germans and what the West and, and the tremendous political and therefore intellectual achievement of Adenauer in shifting people's notions of what, what Germany actually is into a West Germany, which is Atlanticist, um, and which is seeking integration with, with France. And by the way, the whole idea that Franco-German reconciliation is the essential thing that you need after the Second World War is part of this process, right? France is a distraction for Germany in the Second World War. It's not this, it's not the essential target. And so if, if you, therefore, logically, Franco-German recon reconciliation, which I'm not saying shouldn't happen, by the way, it's a wonderful thing, I'm all in favor, but Franco-German reconciliation doesn't get you to the essence of the conflict in the Second World War. Not even, not even close. Um, and, and analytically speaking, it is also a distraction. And so, you know, when if if Schultz and Macron actually said, as they were reported to have said at a dinner party not so long ago, that Ukraine and Russia should follow the Russian, you know, that they should follow the example of of, uh, of 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 France and Germany, there's something important which is missing in that in that comparison, um, which is that Frank that France wasn't actually the main enemy of Germany. There's also something which is more important which is missing, fundamental, which I'm going to return to, which is that. Franco-German reconciliation happened after Germany was defeated. Um, and defeat here is the key category, not peace, um, which is the point to which I'm going to return. Okay, so um, so the 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 th this is it's it's very useful, I think, to 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 correct to correct and get Germany into a story where actually German history looks less exceptional. And you know, one of the big problems that German historians have is like this problem of exceptionality. One way that it's not exceptional is the, the imperial pattern or the colonial pattern. It's just that Hitler had the innovation of trying to carry out the, the colonial practice inside Europe, which throws us because we, we tend to think the colonialists are from Europe and the colonized are outside of Europe, which is, which is a mental habit which in the contemporary world is probably worth revising. Right? It's possible for anyone to colonize anyone else. Um, so if, you, if we look at the Second World War this way, then suddenly German history actually seems a bit more normal. And by the way, the point that I'm making was made by Hannah Arendt, um, and it was made by a huge range of African-American analysts you know, beginning in 1944 or so. Right? That the reason why we see this differently is that it's in Europe, right? but it's actually a colonial project. Okay, so if we, if we, if we, if we slot Germany in to, to European history in this way, then we, we, have, we have the advantage um, of, of seeing um, a history, I think, of Europe and integration, which makes more sense. Germany becomes, as they say, a particularly intense case of a general rule. You, you lose the war, and then you, and then you seek Europe as an alternative. Um, 1945 is then one in a chain of colonial wars, which Europeans, after generally you know, winning them, seek, start to generally lose. It also makes, and this is very important, it makes Ukraine, it puts Ukraine in the story, in a specific way. Because now Ukraine is also a specifically is, is a specific example of a general war, which is that you, you, you lose wars and terrains, which you then forget about, right? Which you then forget about. So again, it, I think it's helpful to think about Ukraine in this way um, as, as, a colon, as a colonial object, because the, the process by which Germany forgets that Ukraine is essential to its own history is the same process by which the French forget Algeria, Southeast Asia, the same process by which the Dutch forget Indonesia. The fact that their little countries are in Europe turns out not to matter. The fact that Ukraine and Germany are not very far apart turns out to matter less than the structure of the former colonial relationship. It is extraordinary the extent to which West German historiography and pedagogy has had put in Ukraine entirely outside of the Second World War, even though it was the object of German aggression in the Second World War. Right? So that, that, seems, that seems less extraordinary when you realize that that is just one chapter in the general European story of choosing Europe in order not to talk about the colonial past. Right? Okay.
So you get, so I think that's one of the gains. There are, there are more gains to, to thinking about the story this way. Um, one of them, aside from making the federal public seem you know, less, less inexplicable, is that it, you, you, in returning, you, you're forced to return Eastern Europe to the story. So if you're running, if you're running the narrative of the European Union, you, you talk about central, West, you said Western Europe, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, um, maybe Southeastern Europe, Greece, but you don't actually have to talk about Eastern Europe until 1989. And then as a, as a kind of irritant. And then eventually it was 2004 and the enlargements after that. But you find yourself running the story of the European Union for decades without Eastern Europe actually being mentioned. If you, if you see the European Union as a post-imperial form of political practice, then you're forced to remember, okay, there is a post-colonial territory next door. And then you're also then, of course, ask the question, what happened to it? And then ask the question, okay, how do we understand the Soviet relationship to Eastern Europe? Is that also an imperial relationship or not? Which is something we'll talk about later. But I will just mention here as an asterisk, if we accept that the German relationship to Ukraine was colonial, right? And again, the empirics are here pretty overwhelming. I mean, Hitler refers explicitly to India as an example, much more often the United States as an example. Um, America is the model frontier empire as far as he is concerned with its use of slave labor and its displacement of native populations, right? So the, the empirics here, I think, are pretty overwhelming. But there's another inspiration which one ought not to overlook, which is that one of the things the Germans are interested in about Ukraine is, in fact, the thing they're most interested in, is extracting the grain, right? extracting the grain. And of course, just to open up a parenthesis in my parenthesis, that, that's, a very, that's, a, that's a continual feature in the very long history of Ukraine. Um, in fact, basically the entire, not just the EU narrative, but the entire Western Civ narrative depends upon grain being taken from Ukraine. So if at any point in your Princeton education they made you learn about Athens, they probably did, which they should have. They really should have. That's good. I won't. You should have learned about Athens. But what they didn't make you learn, like, so did you ever ask, how is it that when you learned about Athens, it was all like wine? Like, why was it all, why was it all olives? Like, how did they just did they live on olives? Right, you never ask yourself that. Right, did they live on olives? Like Athena and the olive tree, like what's up with that? How could it just be olives? <laughs> and grapes. Yeah. And, and the answer is, you won't be surprised to hear, Ukraine. Right, that's, that's what fed Athens. The southern, the northern coast of Latvia, the southern coast of what's now Ukraine, where the war is now being fought. That is how Athens was set. And much of the, the Western Civ, the rest of the Western Civ education kind of goes like that. Okay, so jumping ahead now to the Soviet Union, the reason why I'm thinking about this is that one of the, one of the inspirations for the German planning in Ukraine was Soviet planning in Ukraine. One of the reasons why the Germans thought it would be possible to extract food from Ukraine was that the Soviets had just done so in the first and second five-year plans. And the fact that four million Ukrainians had starved to death during the first five-year plan was seen as positive. Right? That was a positive example of how things could be done. It proved that you could extract with starvation. So the Germans were taking that model, you know, when, and so that's just something to think about. That in, in, from, from, from this perspective, some things that the Soviet Union do also, also, make, also fall into line and make a kind of sense. Okay, the other thing which is gained by this is that Search so Eastern Europe is in the story, but Eastern Europe is in the story together with the rest of the world, which to me is like the most important ethical and analytical advantage. That the moment you bring Eastern Europe into the story, you're also bringing uh, the, you're bringing Africa and you're bringing Southeast Asia, and you're into the story. You're bringing the entire history of European colonialism in some way or another into the story, along with Eastern Europe. It happens at the same at the same time. Um, and not only does that make more sense, I think it's also it, like it's it, I think it's ethically refreshing and, 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 and useful. And it means that when we start talking about like Eastern, like East Europeans and their whole return to Europe bit, you know, so that's been one of the dominant tropes for, I guess, longer than some, many of you here can remember, but the idea that when 1989, we're gonna to return to Europe. The problem with that, the problem with that, or the weakness of that, of that conceit, or one of the weaknesses is that the East European part of the story is when you, when, once you open up the history of Eastern Europe, it's not so much a return to Europe as a return to the world or a return to Europe and the world, right? Because you can't really understand the East, Euro East European history without the, the various imperial references. 
even if they're very modest ones like that, like the Habsburgs or you know the, the Romanovs. You, you, as soon as you move into Eastern Europe, you're moving into the Empire, and as soon as, you, as soon as you're moving into the Empire, you move into the history of the world. And so the opening, the opening up of East European history can't be closed with the notion of a return to Europe. In some way, like that phrase, politically attractive and understandable as it was, is incredibly misleading because by return to Europe, what they meant was we would have just been on this EU train the whole time if it weren't for these accidents that happened to us, right? But, but if you look at the history, what you find instead is something much more like, ah, Eastern Europe is a zone which leads you out into these broader considerations of colonial history. And these broader considerations of colonial history in turn help you make sense of Spanish and Portuguese and Italian and West German and French and Belgian history in a way that the EU narrative itself doesn't help you make sense. Okay, so uh, another thing which you gain analytically from all of this is that if you start to see European history in the 20th century as a succession of failed colonial wars, which Europeans then find ways to, you know, to sweep out of the picture, um, then, you're, then maybe you also have a framework for Afghanistan in 1979, or you may have a framework for Ukraine in 2022. You may have a framework in which you see, okay, it's not so surprising that the Soviet Union ceased to exist after losing the imperial war in Afghanistan, right? And it's not so surprising, et cetera, or that like, the, the nature of the state of Russia is now, is, is now up for grabs because it's invaded Ukraine. Now, that may seem like a striking thing to say, but here's the thing. The European nation states never existed. This is the, like, this is the, this is the one of the nice things that you, the EU story does is it gives agency to entities which never actually existed. Because the entities which were supposed to have said war bad, peace good, they never existed. There was never a France which said that. There was a French empire which broke up as it was joining the European Union. Right? There was a Dutch empire that broke up. I'm using European Union some some anachronist later, but there was a there was a Dutch empire that broke up as the Dutch joined the European integration process. Right? Belgium, Portugal, Spain. Britain. It's all the same story. There is no moment you can put your finger on and say, aha, here is the moment where the nation state made the choice because there wasn't a nation state. There wasn't a nation state. Right? And I, I, any Swedes in the crowd, I'm, I'm ready for you. But in general, in general, there wasn't a nation state. Um, there was an empire which joined as empire faded integration increased. Right? It's like this. It's not that there was a nation state choosing one or the other. Right? And so that helps you to understand what the stakes of this war are a little bit, right? What happens when an empire chooses to fight a war um, and, and may lose it? And it makes the notion that Russia, what I'm trying to say is that it makes the notion that Russia might fall apart not so historically strained as it might seem, right? Not so historic. It might even start to seem like, well, that wouldn't be so surprising, right? That wouldn't, that wouldn't be so surprising. That's, that's what actually tends to happen in these situations. Okay. The last thing I want to say about that is the conclusion is what is this then give us, as we try to evaluate the behavior of the European Union and its main member states in the 21st century. What do, what do we get from this? I think if you accept the analysis, uh, the really important thing you get is that the true constitutive other of the European Union is empire. It's European empire. That is the true constitutive other of the European Union, is their own empires. And the magic of this constitutive other is that it disappears the moment that it constitutes you, right? The moment that you say, aha, I have chosen Europe, you are also choosing not to have to teach your children about their actual history, um, which is a familiar tendency in other <laughs> law democracies as well, right? So the, the, moment that, the moment that you're making this choice is the moment where you can dump the baggage of 500 years of maritime empire or whatever it might have been. Um, but the, the insight um, that, 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 that empire is Europe's, Europe's actual constitutive other um, is, is, is important if it's true, and I'm happy to talk more about it, but it's important if it's true because no one, as far as I know, almost no one ever says that, and it's not the way that European leaders are actually, are actually comporting themselves um, in rhetoric or, or in practice. And, uh, you know, of course, what it means is that the, the, the moralizing story of the European Union isn't true. Right? It's not true that there were European nation states and they saw that war was bad. There were never European nation states, they didn't see that war was bad. There were European empires and they lost wars one after the other and they got to where they are today. But it also follows from this, if you, if you, once, 
once you remember that empire is the constitutive other of Europe, then you think, well, maybe empire still exists. Maybe Russia is an empire. Right? If, if, if the process of the last hundred years or so in Europe has been empires lose war, cease to exist, and you can extend this analysis, right? I mean, I'm talking about the maritime empire. So if, you could, if you wanted to, you could go back to the First World War and say, First World War, the land empires lose, cease to exist. Second World War thereafter, you know, maritime empires cease to exist. But if you see this long delay of European empires losing wars against one another or against, against colonized peoples and ceasing to exist, um, then you suddenly have a pattern, but you, would, you might say, well, well, okay, there might still be other empires which have wars to lose, right? That, that <coughs> might be happening now. That might be normal, right? What we're seeing now might be a part of a normal, unsurprising European process which is suppressed only by the narrative of the European Union itself. Because in suppressing your own imperial history, you're also suppressing your ability to recognize other empires, even when they're telling you with great stridency that they are empires. And that's, that, I think, is a big part of the, of the relationship between United Germany and the Russian Federation and the European Union in general and, and, the, Russian, and the Russian Federation. Um, another thing that you gain from this is that it helps you to think a little bit more clearly about the relationship between economics and peace. So the standard German argument for taking up, um, used by both major German political parties for taking up Nord Stream 2 after Russia invaded Ukraine the first time, had to do with the fact that economics determines politics, and so therefore the economic engagement can't be bad. You know, it will probably be good, but it can't be bad. The thing that's missing from that argument is that the economic engagement that happened with the aggressor after the Second World War was after the aggressor was defeated. <laughs> um, and the economic project was begun by, 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 you know, by a West German whose, West Germany whose elites acknowledged quite you know, generally, quite thoroughly, that they had been defeated. Economic integration is something quite different when you do it with the empire before it has been defeated. Like that, that binary seems to be very important to me. That if you, if you are paying off imperial elites, you're doing something different than engaging with a post-imperial defeated power. Right? And in the case of Russia and the imperial elites, I mean, this is another way that it's Russia is very old fashioned. The resources that Germans and others are paying for are extracted from a comparatively small part of the Russian Federation, which is thousands of kilometers away from the people who hold power. And the people who live near where the resources are extracted get basically nothing as a result. So in, in that sense, it's a classic colonial relationship. Inside, inside the Russian Federation. And once you start seeing things like that, then not just the war, which I've already talked about, but also the, 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 the imperial character of the Russian Federation might come more clearly to view, because then you start to ask questions like, who is fighting this Russian war? In the first instance, it's not the Russians. In the first instance, it's all the national minorities they get their hands on, which of course recalls you know, who fought the French war, who fought, who fought the French wars in Indochina? Well, the, Al the Algerians, of course, right? That's what you do. That's normal. When you're an empire, you take some of your colonial subjects and you make them fight other of your colonial subjects if you can. That's what the French did. That's what the British did. That's also what the Russians are doing, which is why the total number of people killed in Moscow district is right now around 150. Right? Um, whereas if you look at the if you look at the periphery and look at the regions where minorities live, the numbers are much, much, much higher. Not just in absolute terms, obviously, but is, as a scale of the population. So once you start to think, okay, this might be an imperial war then the war itself starts to make sense, not only in its consequences for Ukraine, but also in its consequences inside Russia. The third implication of this, and now this is like the most, you know, for, this, is sort of, this is for the realists out there. Um, the third implication of this is that peace is not the relevant category. So what happened to France and Algeria wasn't peace. What happened to the Dutch and Indonesia was not peace. What happened to the Germans in 1945 was also not peace. Peace didn't happen. What happened was defeat. Defeat is the essential historical category for understanding how empires make a move towards something else. So that, that, so once you realize that, if you accept that this is an imperial war, it then has an influence on how you think about how the war is going to come to an end. Right? So the peace that existed in Europe after 1945 was a peace after an absolutely unambiguous defeat. And it's interesting that the Germans themselves are the ones, not all the Germans, but some of the Germans, are the ones who, 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 who prefer the peace category to the defeat category. And I think there's something quite suspicious about that, actually, in, in, prefer, in, in speaking of peace and not acknowledging defeat. 
uh, because it's the defeat which made all of this possible. It's defeat which made the European project possible. If Nazi Germany had won, it would have been a very different European project. Right? It's defeat, not just in Germany, but it's defeat all around the world. The French, the French have to be chased out. The Belgians have to be chased out. The Spanish and the Portuguese have to be chased out. That's what has to happen for the European project. Not peace, but defeat over and over and over again. And so when one is then thinking about how this war is going to end, it's going to end with somebody being defeated. Someone. Not, I mean, we, we can't say for sure that the imperial power will be defeated. They don't always lose. They might. They don't always lose. But someone is going to lose. And that will have implications for the future of the European Union, which is the next thing you gain from this, from this perspective. If you recognize that empires are still around and that they're the constituent of other of the European Union, then it becomes quite important for the European Union they're still, that they're still around. Right? Because the constituent of other can very quickly become the destructive other. If there are still empires around and if they win, then that means that you lose too. Right? So the, the European Union's narrative um, is, is a way of, I think, making the European Union's existence more unlikely. Because the European Union's narrative doesn't acknowledge, I make the point again, once you allied your own imperial other, you don't recognize the empires that are in the, in the, in the present. Once you, once you forget that the end of empire is how you came into existence, you're not going to recognize that existing empires might threaten that existence. And so this, the, the, this version of the European Union history has that, has that payoff for Europeans as well. And of course, for Russians, um, it may be the most obvious. Right? Uh, the only way Russia wins is by losing. That's the only way Russia wins. I mean, it, it, so if, if, you, if, you, if you accept that there is a chain of imperial wars and that European powers by losing imperial wars become something much more like rule of law nation states and an integration process, which I submit is the norm, then you have to want Russia to lose. And people who care about Russia should want Russia to lose as quickly as possible, with as few casualties right, as possible. So people who wish for Russia, so this is, kind of, this, is my, you know, this is my test for people who actually wish Russia well. And I know quite a lot of Russians who wish Russia well and want, want it to lose as quickly as possible on precisely this logic. And I think they're right. But I want to give the last word to the Ukrainians. Um, because if this analysis is, or something like it is right, then we are in the interesting position where, of course, we talk about the Ukrainians as um, targets of all these atrocities with which I began. And you could not write the history of this war without talking about the kidnappings and deportations and the torture and the death pits and um, it, it, in a war of aggression. You wouldn't want to do that. But in that language, um, Ukraine is, you know, Ukraine, there's the risk that Ukraine becomes an object, right? Or that the story is, is only a victimhood story, which is not, maybe not the most essential element of the truth. Um, it's also the case that the Ukrainians are actors. And this is one of the things which has been most astonishing, I think, to Western audiences or American audiences, that the Ukrainians have actually turned out to be agents in this story, which is, you know, it's a mystery. And one way of solving that mystery, one way of addressing that mystery, is to think of what kinds of agents they have been. So they have been anti-imperial agents, which is a more familiar story, anti-colonial agents, right? They have been agents who have been not just fighting um, for the nation, which interestingly is for some reason, like that's the view that, that we prefer. If they're fighting, they must be fighting for the nation and therefore they're nationalists. Are we sure we like that? Um, but if we remember that this is anti-imperial, then we start thinking, okay, um, would we have just said that the people in Algeria were nationalists? Um, would, is that all we would have had to say about it, right? Is that all we would have had to say that they were nationalists? Or would we have said that the, you know, that, that all anti-colonial movements are just nationalists. What kind of move would that have been? So when we say that people are nationalists, um, we are in a way, like, it's not that that is entirely wrong. I mean, the nation is a very important category, but from, from, a, from a very widespread, and I would say close to consensus Ukrainian point of view, the struggle for the nation is simultaneously an anti-colonial struggle and a pro-European struggle. So the agency that's being exercised is not just an agency in opposition, it's an agency of definition in which the Ukrainians are not just saying that we are a nation, they're also saying that we are not an empire and that we want to be in Europe. And that's actually the, the, the very striking thing, right, about just as a matter of, you know, not just public opinion polls, but as a matter of what people are willing to take risks for. It's the Ukrainians who are the ones who take risks for Europe and say that they're taking risks for Europe. And that's, that's, a, kind of, that's, a, kind of, that's a kind of agency. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to say is that uh, the this interpretation that I'm giving um, is actually, I mean, it might be a little bit odd on the American East Coast, but in a kind of, in one version, 
this is what the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs says. The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs says it's empire, it's integration, and empire's going away. It's also, with a different moral cadence, the version of a lot of Ukrainians who I talked to when I was in Ukraine last week or when I go to Ukraine in general, which is that it's empire against integration and integration has to win. And I don't think that those are voices which are only present because of the strife of war. I think it's rather that the intensity of the war helps people to get close to what is actually going on in the history of European Union. So, thank you.